So first of all, I just want to say um, my experience here in Australia has been great. Um, I want to thank everybody. Um, it's been a wonderful whirlwind tour so far, um, but it's been um, an amazing experience so far. I want to thank IDEX for um, sponsoring me to come out here, and it was exciting to see a kangaroo. So it was kind of exciting. I know that may seem really boring to you guys, but I've seen them in zoos, of course, at home, but um, never before that. So this is going to be a little different presentation than most of you have probably seen before, because I'm really not going to focus a lot on the whole medicine aspect of it. What I'm going to focus on is what's helped me be successful in my practice. Um, and I've been recently, over the last couple of years, presenting um, throughout the world, um, a lot in the, in the States, but also through Asia and also through Europe, a lot about what my success has been. Um, and that, that message, us as veterinarians, we're all very similar, wherever we're at. Um, you know, tend to be great, hardworking people, very ethical, and we're all very similar. It's been a really rewarding process for me to meet veterinarians from everywhere, but we also are faced with all the same challenges. I think this profession is at a very exciting point, but it's also a point where it's, it's becoming very critical. We're nation, or worldwide, we're having a, you know excess number of veterinarians. Um, we have some interesting challenges with corporate involvement um, everywhere. How is that going to play a role in the future? You know, what role is insurance going to have? Um, we're at a changing time. I think overall the big picture is it's going to be great because that pet bond is just getting stronger and stronger and, and more people are looking towards their pets. Um, but we can't, we have to change. We can't be doing exactly the same thing as what we were doing 20 years ago or we won't, we will not be successful. So we'd have to look at where this future is going to take us and that's kind of what we're going to talk about here today. So first of all, this picture of um, my hospital. Um, we're located about an hour and a half north of Seattle, so there actually is that much room in there. Um, so we're about halfway between Seattle and the Canadian border. Um, so I can go to Vancouver, BC in about the same amount of time. We're in a pretty rural area. The town is only 4,000 people. Um, we have an 18% unemployment. We have a lot of foreclosure. It's not a very high economy area. It's not like we're in Microsoft area. Um, but we've been able to build this business um, fairly rapidly from a two veterinary practice up to seven, and I actually just hired my eighth veterinarian. Um, and so we've been growing fairly well despite the economy in the area. Um, so a lot of times when I'm talking or I do some consulting, I'll be down in you know Redmond area where Microsoft is, and they're, they're complaining about their profitability. I'm like, you guys have all these people here. So the, the model can work no matter where you're at, I guess is the bottom line. Um, we did open in 1988. Um, I was an associate um, right out of that school. I got hired there in 91 and then became an owner in 93. We are mixed animal still, so we are rapidly becoming closer to 100% small animal, but when we started we were 10% small animal, 90% um, large, and then that's over the 20 years or so it's been rapidly changing. We did gross um, 3.4, and our growth last year was at 15% um, revenue growth. Um, this year, year to date, we're over 18%. So let's take in a bigger picture. If we look at the states and the status of the veterinary industry currently in the states, um, or in the past during the recession time, revenues during in the states amongst across all veterinary clinics were it was about five percent down. But there was a segment of practices out there that were well exceeding that growth rate. Um, the same phenomenon is happening now. Revenues are up last year, about 3% revenue increase across the nation um, amongst veterinary clinics. But there's still a segment of these practices that are growing pretty rapidly. And when you start looking at those, that group of practices that have maintained this growth, it has nothing to do with their size of their practice. Some are single doctor practices, some are 12 to 15 doctor practices. Um, it doesn't matter where they're located. Some are located in big cities, some are rural, some are in the northeast, some are in the south. Um, it didn't matter um, where they're located at on that. The other thing when you're looking at these curves, you know, we're concentrating on these, but what's happened to these guys? And that's been a new phenomenon that's happened for us. Um, and in our area, we've had a clinic go bankrupt, close their doors, guy lost his house, got a divorce, and he was good bad. He just was awful at running his business. But that's been a new phenomenon. We didn't see that before, but we're starting to see that happen now. 
Um, it used to be, as a veterinarian, you could put up a shingle, and if you were ethical and you worked hard, some were more successful than others, um, but everybody made it, and that's not true anymore. You have to pay attention to your business side of things, or you're gonna be one of these guys down here and you're gonna be struggling to make that mortgage payment. So back to these guys, what separates them out? The number one thing that separates them out is they've really focused on always trying to do what's best for the pet. And this was a major you know, change for us about five years ago. We changed our whole focus of our practice with that question always be number one thing that we asked. Is it best for the pet? So if we discussed, you know, should we get a digital x-ray machine and send those off for telemedicine? Is it best for the pet? Yes. So let's do that. Let's figure out a way to do that. So everything decision we make on an individual case basis or also as a whole practice basis, making that decision. Other businesses have used this. I was studying a little bit about Amazon.com and Amazon.com, every meeting they have, whether it's three people or 5,000 people, they have an empty chair sitting there. And that empty chair is to represent the client um, because that's who their focus is. So we actually started putting a dog bed for every meeting we had. Um, sounds really corny, right? But occasionally we're like, was well, it best for that pet that's supposed to be sitting in there? Um, having that focus really can help direct your practice. Um, as a business owner, I was struggling getting my whole staff on board. Like, and I was really at first focused on, I wanna give you guys raises, I wanna expand, I wanna do, buy some new equipment, so we need to do better, we need to do more so I can afford to do those sorts of things. And it really went right on top of their head. Once I started focusing on, we wanna do these things because it's best for the pet, it changed the whole environment that we had. People got that. The end result was I was able to get raises, buy new equipment, expand, but the focus, the first question was, is it best for the pet? One way to measure that is through diagnostics. So my belief is diagnostics are what's best for the pet. Um, baseline testing for what I call, you know, quote, healthy animals um, is beneficial for that pet. We can't tell when we're examining that 10-year-old cat does it, what it, what's its T4, what's its creatinine? I, it can't tell, right? You can't tell just from doing a good physical exam all the time. And there's all sorts of examples, but it is benefit. The old philosophy of you know, testing before you treat, it's beneficial for that pet if we can try to diagnose something. We have a lot of clinics um, in our area or in the states who they give a shot of steroids, they give a shot of penicillin and call me in a week if it's not better. Is that really the best for the pet philosophy? Um, no, it's better to try to figure out what's going on first because we can pinpoint our treatment um, onto that. Pre-anesthetics, is it best for the pet if we know where we're at electrolyte wise? Do we know where our kidney function is prior to anesthesia? Yes. So start looking at diagnostics as a picture. So back again, once this bell-shaped curve, that's what really separates these out, is what percentage of their practice is diagnostics. So this number is average in the state. 16% of the average veterinary clinic's revenue is diagnostics. So diagnostics include x-ray, blood work, your cytologies, um, ultrasound, anything you're using to diagnose it, that piece of that pie on average is 16%. If you start looking at AHA practices, which tend to be a much higher level or at least somewhat of a higher level practice, they're in the 18 to 20 percent um, of their revenues. But then once again, back to that curve, who are the ones that are really blowing the average out? They're really exceeding that average. They're up at that 25 to 26 percent range on the things. It is the number one determinant of success, irregardless of a specialty clinic, or a single doctor practice, multiple, is what percentage of their revenue is diagnostics. A big part of that is everything else feeds off of that, right? The more you test, the more from a business standpoint you find, and ultimately what you do better for that pet. So I would certainly never recommend a test if I didn't think it was best for the pet. And that's certainly one you know, critical thing. You have to start with that question. Um, I wouldn't sleep well at night if I ever did 
testing that I didn't think was best. But if it is best for the pet, let's figure out a way to do that. How do we get there? How do we get to one, improving that experience, increasing our diagnostics, doing what's best for the pet? And I'm gonna go through kind of the steps that we undertook onto this, um, and hopefully you can relate some of that back to your own practice that way. So first was establishing a protocol, establishing what is best for that pet when they come in because they have XYZ, they, because they're a senior, because they're, you know, have a hot spot, um, because they're inappropriately urinating. What is best for that pet that what occurs? You know, comprehensive physical exam, history taking, maybe an ultrasound exam of the bladder, you know, a complete urinalysis, whatever you want to decide, but determine what is best for that pet if they present with these sets of signs. The last thing I'd want to do is take the, what I call it the art of veterinary medicine out of things. I mean, we're all individuals. I never know what I'm going to see when I walk into that exam room, right? But based on the reason they're coming in, there is some minimal database that I want to have to help appropriately treat that animal. And so as a clinic, establishing that protocol. And then selecting who you're targeting. Um, this is really applicable for your, you know, your senior pets. Um, when do you call them a senior? When do you start recommending different levels of wellness testing, depending on age, depending on um, their, their weight, or whatever you decide to as a, as a clinician? And then setting the client expectations which is a huge step into things. Um, I'll go into a little more specifics on this. But we don't do a very good job as, as a profession to tell our clients what we're gonna want to do or what's going to happen when they show up. Um, and an example of this is, let's say you are a, um, or my wife. My wife takes her car in for oil change. She does it every 3,000 miles. She goes in, it's 49 bucks, and it's fairly quick in and out, and that's what happens. She shows up next time, and the mechanic says, hey, it's time for a tune-up. What is her compliance? He's probably exactly right. The car is probably due for a tune-up, right? But what is her compliance? She's not prepared. She doesn't know. She's like, well, I don't know if I have time for that today. I wasn't in the budget. I wasn't planning on it. I didn't know to expect this. Let's just do it next time. Well, that's what our clients have to do a lot of times. So, Senior blood work, we start at seven years of age. If they're coming in every year for their vaccines and their full physical exam, have we told them that next time we're gonna recommend blood work? Or is it a surprise? Why now? You know, why is it happening? We need to set those expectations up ahead of time. And then the last step is what I call the wow factor. Create this amazing experience that they've never had before. Um, and separate yourself out. Make it unique. Um, one of the reasons I've been successful is I have clients that drive by, I've added it up 24 different veterinary clinics they drive by on the way to mine. Why? It's not because I'm a better veterinarian than anybody else. It's because that client experience is amazing when they show up into my hospital. And ultimately that can be a major differentiator of you as a practice. Trending is another thing. If I show a client a whole bunch of numbers, I, watch, watch your clients if you show them a page with a whole bunch of lab results. They're, they're tuned out instantly. They're phased out. They're like, whoa, I have no idea what all these letters and numbers, and it doesn't mean anything to them on that. Show them this, they get it. They understand a graphical presentation. They may have no idea what creatinine is, they have no idea that this gray box here is, and I'll show you more of this in VetConnect Plus, is the normal range from there to there. They just know that this is happening. It's our job to explain it to them, right? But instantly when they see that, they're like, well, why is it going up, doc? Why is it rising? It, it ultimately involves in that case on the things. A very dramatic difference than showing them this. Another thing is the iPhone app. So the iPhone app is um, a pretty neat addition to this. The nicest benefit of it is how often do we keep going back to say, are those results in yet? Are those results in yet? Um, 
We can specify it for the individual um, veterinarian. So I don't get Dr. Searles, Jake's results. I only get my own. Um, and I can set it up where it alerts me when any results come in. So I'm no longer keep checking, is that histo done? Is that histo done? It will alert me when it's done. So it really, from an efficiency standpoint, it definitely really helps onto that. Um, we can also consult with internal medicine directly through here or request a consult, I should say. Um, and I'll show you how easy that is. The nice thing about this is how often are you in the room? Well, I guess first thing, did you guys all know that you can consult with your internal medicine on just your in-house results too? Which I didn't realize until recently. So if you just did a CBC on your, um, your laser site, you can um, call up and if you question on it, you can get an internal medicine consult on those results too. It does, it's not just for the reference lab. Um, but while I'm in the consult room, I'll say, I'm not sure exactly what's going on in here. I need to talk to a specialist on this. Um, right then and there, I can go ahead and request and I can select a time that I would like them to call me. Because what was happening to me all the time before was I would be tell them that and then next thing you know, I'm in another exam, another exam. Next thing you know, it's 6.30 at night and I'm like, sometimes the client be calling like, well, do you hear back from the specialist? I'm like, hmm probably help if I called them first, <laughs> you know. Um, and so it really helps with that workflow within the room. Another thing that Vet Connect Plus will do for you is it, it will make transferring medical or diagnostic records between veterinarians much easier. And I'll show you how easy it is, but if I have a client, let's say a client that I've been managing a chronic care issue, let's say I've been managing a kidney issue for five years, and we have a lot of data, we have a lot of points. They move down here to Australia. Um, I can fax you the medical records, but I can share all those diagnostic results with you. And all of everything that I have in VetConnect Plus for that patient will be put into your VetConnect Plus for that patient. Um, where it's really applicable also is those ones that get some diagnostics done at the specialist and some here. Like we have a lot of oncology patients. They go to the oncologist, then they come to me, and they go back and forth. Sometimes they have a CBC run here, sometimes here. We merge together, so we always see each other's results for that patient. Um, you have to accept this linkage, so if I send it down to you, you would have to say, yeah, Peter Brown, you can share these results with me, that's fine. Um, but it, it enables that communication back and forth. How often when I get second opinions in the past, I would get a stack of 40 faxed Half of it I couldn't read. Some of it's crooked. Some of it's, it's all over the place, right? Realistically, do you look at every set of lab work that dogs had done or that cats had done? No. You're lucky if you find the last one. I don't know how people get so many. And it's never in order, right? So but um, now we get, yes, you still have to go through your medical records, but we have all of those sent to us directly through the Vet Connect Plus. When you do that, you get an email so once again, if my client moved down to Australia, you would get an email that I was like to share these results with you. And if you hit this, then instantly all of that is put into your VetConnect Plus onto that. And I'll show you how simple it is. And then once you're linked together, um, it's a constant back and forth unless you de-link each other, you know, de-friend each other on that, um, which is able to do. So Vet Connect Plus, like I said, it takes all of your diagnostic data, reference lab or in-house, and puts it all together. It organizes it. It's cloud-based. And you can access it any place, obviously, in the world. Um, so this is live. This is on to my own Vet Connect Plus account here. This is live on here. So it puts it all that together. It compares. So it's the first system I've ever seen that where you can compare sample that was run on your laser site or run on your pro site and compare that to the reference lab CBC. So I can track, it doesn't matter where that blood test was ran, we can trend those across the board onto there. The upper corner right there, um, the little dog, if you hit that, that shows what patient it is on the things. Um, this shows um, the diagnostic history 
So just chronologically running down here, what was run, where it was run at. If you could see the bottom two on here, the little beaker looking there, um, that's from a reference lab. Upper here shows the picture of the instrument that was run in-house, um, the catalyst on those top two, and then a snapshot reader, and then the health check here. Um, this shows um, communication, so the next one over. And then obviously down here is where all the information is. So this is historical running across here. Um, this has the current one, you know, yesterday's results in here, what they are. I can scroll up and see the chemistry that's down below, or if you had a urinalysis down below, or if you had a snapshot reader below, it would just be in this line right up there um, you could do. Um, you can, by hitting the little arrow over there, you can see you know, more things across there if you want to look at the numerical values. Um, but then you could also hit this trending button right there um, and trend any of these. And so this will pull up these trend graphs. You can make them bigger. I'll show you that again. Um, by hitting that little expand button right there. Um, this is accessible from iPads but, or from a desktop or any place you have internet. It's just a um, www bet connect um, plus. So you can um, you know, look at the matacrits here. So this is conversation point. Um, we'll discuss this like, you know, hey, we've been kind of running along the bottom level of things here. Um, I'm just nice to see a little tick up on there. We're going to keep monitoring this, make sure we don't come, become more anemic. That's all it takes, but it's impactful for the client more than just telling them, hey, good, the matacrits up too. This means a lot more to them. Um, I have no idea what's going on with this case because I just randomly picked who came in yesterday. So, um, you know, go over the white blood count. Um, show them the BUN. Show them the creatinine. I mean, this creatinine is a great one to say, this is amazing. We are nice and steady on this. This is something we're going to keep checking every year. Because if I start seeing it go up like this, that's a concern. Um, but clients understand that conversation. The other thing that I've done, because the reference lab still has a place, sometimes based on workflow, we do blood work that still goes to the reference lab. It's harder to communicate this as well, but one thing I started doing was emailing the client those results prior to my phone call, and they are looking at the same trend graph as I am. Um, and I'll, because most of them have tablets, um, they can pull it right up on their tablet or on their computer while I'm talking to them on the phone, and we'll go over the trend together. And it's very impactful. It, it eases that communication a lot better, and the client just gets it. They just get it more. Um, you can go through any of these. If you want to pick more, you can just go and say, hey, well, I also want to trend sodium. Just by hitting it, it will place a, um, one of those in there, a sodium um, graph in there. You can also take some way, let's say I don't want to look at the BUN um, by hitting that same. So you can pick and choose onto that. Um, and if, um, and then you see on these data points, if you do want to see what the actual, if you just press on the little point, it does show you right up there what date and what the actual value was onto there. Does that make sense on that? Um, you will be shocked at how, I don't look at results any other way anymore. And I get them put in, I have Cornerstone, so I get these results automatically put into my practice management system. I don't even go there to look anymore. I go directly onto here. Because it's great for me to look at it, but it's also very impactful for the client onto that. Right up here on this little double head, right there, um, if you hit that, this is how you can communicate to your clients. So you can go ahead and email directly right from here to them. And they see the trend graphs. They see it's a PDF file that goes off to them. You can write in comments. This is also where you can collaborate. So once again, if it's a specialist, if it's a client of mine that moves to Arizona, whatever else, this is how we can collaborate. You select who it's coming from. I'm going to select Todd Page here because I like to send him random stuff. Um, and you could say test. Um, I can hit share. Um, yeah, you could type in 
you wouldn't probably type in test, but you could say, hey, this client, client of mine's moving down to Australia. Um, I recommended you. Um, here are the results. Um, look for the facts of all the medical notes, or they'll be bringing their notes. Um, those results have already been shared. He's getting that email already that says he'd like to share it. He clicks accept, those results are all put in there. It's that simple to share across. Um, it's a really underused feature in North America, um, but once you start doing it, it is amazing. Now when we get records in, we tell the clients, hey, send, or the other veterinary clinic, can you go ahead and just share the diagnostic results with you? At first they're like, huh? What do you mean share them? Like, what does that mean? Like, but once, once they're starting to get into this habit now, and it's really starting to explode because of how easy it is. And you can actually link, I think it's up to 24 different veterinary clinics together. Um, so if you have one patient that travels around to a lot of different vets, um, they could all be linked in there together, which might get kind of confusing. But um, then you can do your trend graph no matter where those results were done. Um, this little plus button right there, or actually, sorry, I'm having a hard time seeing the screen here, but right there um, is where you will do your internal medicine um, request. Um, so I can request what time I want them to call. Um, I can request on there, I can type in comments. Obviously I have to explain the case to whoever I'm calling, but it, it enables them to call me. It helps my workflow into things. It will surprise you once you start using it, how much you do use it. Um, and I use it probably equally on my PC as I do on my iPad. Though I use it on my iPad always in the room. But if I'm on the phone, or if I'm going over cases or reviewing things in my office, I'm just doing it on my PC. I just have it as an icon on there and I just press it, it pulls right up. It works the exact same functionality with a mouse and a pointer onto uh, things. You gotta just play with it. You're not gonna break anything, right? First of all, you're not gonna like lose the results. They're not gonna be gone. At least I haven't figured out how to do that. Um, you just gotta play with it and try different things and see, oh, can I do this? How do I do that? So kind of in summary on here, and then we'll kind of open up for any questions. Um, I'm a huge believer, if you haven't gotten that yet, but that you gotta communicate to your clients. And ultimately, that's what's gonna make you successful. Ultimately, if you can't figure that piece of things out, you're not gonna be able to practice best medicine, your business isn't gonna thrive, you're not gonna be able to grow, and ultimately, you're going to be pushed away by others as we get more and more veterinarians in here, more and more of a corporate role. Your practices won't be survived if we can't figure out how to communicate. Um, to the clients. And that level of communication has to be more than just telling them what to do because that doesn't work anymore. And I look at it the other way too. If my client's not saying yes, I'm letting that pet down. This is Jazzy. I get a picture every week in my email from Jazzy's owner in all different outfits. So I figured <laughs> I'd put Jazzy in there. Um, she, she has a really rough life, you can tell. So, um, but ultimately, if she doesn't, if, Jazzy's owner, whose name's Kathy, who would do anything, but if she didn't say yes to my recommendations, then I'm letting Jazzy down. Um, if I didn't do the right job in communicating to her. Sometimes you can't, it doesn't work all the time, right? I mean, there's some situations, person just lost their job, they're losing their house, their husband just left them. I mean, there's situations that doesn't, right? But we have to focus on that as our job is to try to get that client to do what's best for the pet. This, pro this concept of getting our clients to see us, it applies to when I'm recommending a referral to a specialist, when I'm recommending additional diagnostics, when I'm recommending wellness screens, um, when I'm recommending therapeutics, whatever it is, it's that same concept that client has to say yes to our recommendations on the things. And how do we communicate that to it? And utilizing the tools and technology we have today to do that. Um, you, you need to figure that point out on the things. If I don't have a strong bond between myself and my clients, I can't practice best medicine. They made us feel like family, much the way they make the animals feel like part of their family. 
We just developed an immediate bond with them. A critical part of that bond is engaging your clients. You have to involve them with that care. You have to show them what you're doing. You have to create that wow experience. They have to trust us enough to tell them how to take care of their pet, and they have to be a participant in their pet's care. This is Mitchell. He's two years old. This is Madison. She's 18 months old. We were at the dog park, and he did not want to play with his friends. He wasn't sniffing. He wasn't rolling. He just wasn't himself. So off to Dr. Brown's we went. They need to have urgency to come into my clinic to be seen. Pets can't drive themselves here. They need to have urgency to act. Yesterday, we had a kitty named Annabelle come in, and so Annabelle is a very senior kitty, and we want to make sure that the pet is actually doing okay, making sure their organs are functioning normally. It's so nice to be able to draw the blood, and by the time we're done discussing their concerns, we actually have the blood work available. We're able to go over it in the exam room. And they are involved with that case. This is where trending and graphing, clients understand that. They understand a flow and a chart more than just a piece of paper with a lot of numbers. The results of the Coombs test were positive, so we did have a confirmation that Mitchell did have IMHA. Trisha was an amazing client through this. I mean, we were seeing Mitchell and Trisha on almost a daily basis. I think trust is a huge issue when we recommend blood work or we recommend to run an annual 40X screen. They're kind of hesitant at first, but when we tell them it takes 10, 15 minutes, they're so excited. I could check blood results online and they have immediate blood results there in the clinic, which is very important to me. We just had a cat that was in because her ultrasound showed a tumor. He came out 20 minutes into the surgery and said, I'm sorry, but there is cancer throughout. I stayed in one of the rooms just to hold her after she had passed. He was waiting for us out here. He had tears streaming down his face that will always keep us coming back here. I'm very much engaging them in what's happening with their pet, and that engagement leads to compliance. Without the team at Chuckanut Valley Vet, I don't think Mitchell would be here today.